Okay. <laughs> Good evening. Welcome to Calvary Chapel. Let's stand for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just come before you and uh, we want to sit at your feet and uh, learn from you tonight, Father. I just pray that you would uh, bless Pastor Tony as he brings your word and uh, that we will, it will sink into us, Lord. That you would uh, bless the children and the youth as they gather and God, that you would bless our worship tonight. And uh, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hebrews 10, 23, it says, Let us hold fast the confessions of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful.
It's time to uh, greet one another. Make sure your cell phones are turned off or on vibrate. And uh, Tony will be right back. <laughs> Hey there, hi there, ho there. <laughs> you bet. <laughs> they are pretty. Your eyes. 
my eyes that bloodshot? <laughs> well, all right. Let's open our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And uh, tonight, I believe we can get 10 and 11 done. Uh, we'll do two chapters again. Uh, Lord willing, and the church don't rise, and I don't get sidetracked and all that. I uh, really appreciate uh, Buzz and Kirby filling in for me. Uh, just in case, and I'm, I'm going to repeat this Sunday, but just in case any of you are thinking, you know, Alaska, really? You know, the church pays him too much. <laughs> just in case you're thinking that. This was an all-expense paid trip. Uh, our daughter uh, had actually uh, booked this in 2019 to do it in the spring of 2020, but we all know what happened then. So it had to get rescheduled and all, but... Uh, it was, it was pretty amazing. <laughs> she said, you know, Mom, Dad, I want to give you guys the vacation of a lifetime. <laughs> and it was, you yeah. uh, know. So, you know, praise God for that. And, but I'm really glad to be back here. I, I really miss it when, I, when I'm not here, when I'm not teaching the Word of God. It's like that's kind of like what God has created me for, <laughs> it seems like. You know? And if I'm not doing that, then I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing, although I know vacations are good, they're, they're great to, to get away and all that. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, once you do that, you kind of recharge the batteries, now it's, you know, it's time. <laughs> it's time to get back to it. So uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for all of your blessings. Lord, you are so good. And Lord, you just, you blow our minds with how good you are to us. And we confess to you, Lord, that we don't deserve one bit of your goodness. But Lord, we know it's all about grace. And so, Lord, with that said, we ask you to further bless us by really opening up your word to us and us to your word. Speak to us now from your word by the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Remember, 2 Corinthians was written uh, after Titus got back uh, from Corinth, after he delivered 1 Corinthians. Uh, and he brought back word that they had received his last letter well and that they had obeyed the commands that were contained in it. Uh, he also, Titus also, reaffirmed that there were those still a hostile against Paul there in Corinth uh, and, and was trying to speak against his message, his ministry, uh, and really they were speaking against the true gospel. Uh, they were actively trying uh, to discredit Paul uh, and by doing so, discredit his teachings so that people would accept their lies. And, and because Paul cared about pleasing the Lord, he cared about the people the Lord cares about, <laughs> the people that the Lord loves. And, and because he cared about people, he was very concerned uh, about them continuing to believe the true gospel. And that's really the heart of any true pastor, too, is that you know, the people that you minister to, uh, you're concerned that they continue on uh, in the truth, continue on with the right relationship with the Lord. So, for in order for that to happen, he needed them to understand the validity of his ministry. We've seen him uh, defend his ministry over and over again in 2 Corinthians, uh, and he's going to do it again here. But it was important that, that they understood that his ministry was real. It was from the Lord, and so was his message. So Paul will start this chapter by really sarcastically quoting some of his opponents. Uh, how they accused uh, him of being bold in letters but weak in presence, kind of, you know, he, he's all bark and no bite kind of thing. Because when Paul was there, he was a timid guy. He was meek, he, and it wasn't his desire to throw his weight around spiritually kind of thing. He wanted to go there uh, really sharing the love of Christ. And so let's go ahead and start uh, with verses 1 through 6. Now I, Paul, myself, am pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am lowly among you, but being absent and bold toward you. But I beg you that when I am present, I may not be bold with that confidence by which I intend to be bold against some, 
who think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Now, don't miss this. He starts right off with telling them that he was pleading with them by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. See, Jesus certainly was meek as a lamb, right? He was the lamb of God. And when it came to those people that called him names, uh, even beating on him, spitting on him, that kind of thing, you know, all of that was in regards to his person, his what they did to him personally. And Isaiah 53, verse 7, prophesied that Jesus would be like that. Uh, it says that he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. See, and that was true. When people reviled him, he didn't revile back. That's a good example for us. There have been those times when... Uh, you know, I've had to bite my tongue and remember this whole concept about the meekness of Christ and how he didn't revile back and, and all that. It's hard, <laughs> but, you know, God gives you the grace that you can do it when you need to do it. But when it came to caring for others, you know, it was one thing when they uh, messed with him personally, but it was a whole other thing, uh, you know, when when the people were doing things that hurt others. Like, think about the, the two different times. One's at, at the beginning of his ministry, and another time to, at the end of his ministry, he made a whip and, and drove the people out of the temple, the money changers and, and all that. They were ripping off the people, and they were causing people not to want to go and worship God. People, ah, man, I don't want to do that. The whole thing's a ripoff, man. It's a scam. And so people weren't going to the temple like they were supposed to, like they were required to under the law. And that angered Jesus because these people, these money changers, the religious leaders of the day were getting in the way of people coming to know God. And that, boy, you know, he was never silent when it came to, to someone keeping people from God. And Paul wanted them to, to make things right before he got there. And we've read that uh, before a couple times. Uh, you know, he didn't want to have to be harsh or bold against some, like he knew he'd probably have to be. Uh, but Paul was not going to fight this battle with, uh, with these detractors according to the flesh, he says here. You know, and when you think about that, we oftentimes think about, oh, yeah, man, the dude <laughs> had gotten the flesh and punched his lights out. Uh, we oftentimes think of getting in the flesh or fighting in the flesh as uh, getting physical. But see, these guys that were the heretics, the false teachers, the false apostles, uh, they were making a showing in the flesh. And he'll talk about that in a bit. Paul wasn't going to get on their level. He wasn't going to be uh, operating in the flesh by putting on fancy robes like they did. He wasn't going to use flowery speech like, like a professional orator would and impress people uh, by his speech. He wasn't going to schmooze anybody and all, you know. Or, or, and he certainly wasn't going to get physical with them either. But like he told the Ephesians in, in, in Ephesians chapter 6, and he said, the weapons of our warfare are spiritual, not carnal, you know, or fleshly. And the main weapon Paul would no doubt use would be the word of God, the sword of the spirit. That's what he was going to use. And if anybody could, Paul could cut you up <laughs> with the word of God, right? I mean, he knew the Old Testament scriptures backwards and forwards and all that, and, and he says here that the word of God would cast down their arguments and anything that would try to place itself above the knowledge of God, which is found in the word of God, the scriptures. You know, Paul, and, and really, really God through Paul, wanted them and us 
to bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And the only way you can do that is to know the will of Christ, know what Christ said. And again, you need the word of God for that. And so that's our biggest weapon. And here's one of the nuggets right here of truth that the world says is impossible to do. Oh, the Bible's wrong. It says you can take your thoughts captive. You can't control what you think. You just think. That's a lie. They want you to believe that. You know, any dead fish can float downstream, you know. But you can, you can take your thoughts captive. When the devil shoots a fiery dart into your head, like the Bible says, you know, we, we can raise up the shield of faith. We, we can put our faith in the word of God, just like Jesus did when Satan tempted him, when Satan shot those fiery darts at him. Well, if you're the son of God, you know, hey, you're pretty hungry. Make those rocks bread. Hey, it is written. You know, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And every time Satan came at him, Jesus responded with the word of God. He quenched those fiery darts, just like we can. And, and when we have these weird thoughts or when somebody tries to lay on some weird doctrine or something from us, we wait a minute, what does the word of God say about that? What does God say about that in his word? And then we need to replace those bad thoughts with the truth found in the word of God. You know, Charles Spurgeon <laughs> used to say, that you can't stop the birds from flying in the air, but you can stop them from making a nest in your hair. And that's true. You can't stop, you know, seeing some things that, that whoa, man, I didn't want to see that. You know, or, you, or hearing things that you didn't necessarily want to hear. Uh, or even sometimes when you have those thoughts, you know, I, I've talked to people, you know, in, in counseling and all that. Pastor, you don't understand, man. Sometimes I'll have really bad thoughts in church. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, okay, you know, take the thoughts captive. You know, everybody is tempted, you know, along those lines. And when Paul says he'd be ready to punish all disobedience, you know, how would he do that? You wonder, well, how did he do that kind of thing? Would he excommunicate those that were preaching heresy? Would he just rebuke them publicly? Was that their punishment? Or would it be something similar to what happened with Peter? Remember when Ananias and Sapphira came there in Acts 5? He said, oh, yeah, man, we want to give everything that we sold that property for uh, to, to the Lord. Yeah, well, you really? You sold it for this much? You know, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and they died. <laughs> Yeah, and maybe it would be like what happened on Crete. Remember when Paul was there on Crete and he was preaching the gospel and there was that, that magistrate there uh, that uh, was being swayed by this false prophet named Bar-Jesus. In Acts 13, verses 9 through 11, it says, Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit. Notice, he wasn't in the flesh. He was motivated by the Holy Spirit. Filled with the Holy Spirit, he looked intently at him and said, O oh, full of all deceit and fraud, and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now, indeed, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Could be that way that he was going to deal with the, the Corinthians there that, that were the her, heretics and the false apostles. We don't know. But whatever it was going to be, you know, punishment is never pleasant. And so he's, he's giving them a warning, you know, warn these guys. <laughs> I'm coming and, and things are going to be different. In verses 7 through 11, he says, do you look at things according to the outward appearance? If anyone is convinced in himself that he is Christ, let him again consider this in himself, that just as he is Christ's, even so we are Christ. For even if I should boast somewhat more about our authority, which the Lord gave us for edification, and not for your destruction, I shall not be ashamed, lest I seem to terrify you by the letters. For his letters, they say, are weighty and powerful." But his bodily presence is weak, and his speech is contemptible. Let such a person consider this, 
that what we are in word by letters when we are absent, such we will also be indeed when we are present. <laughs> you know, historians tell us that Paul really wasn't much to look at. He's kind of short, balding, bulgy guys, bow-legged. But man, the guy was powerful in the spirit. And they would look at him and go, not much kind of thing. But, you know, I, I'll bet old Bar Jesus back there on the island of Crete thought different after dealing with Paul, you know, <laughs> after, after his encounter there. But the Corinthian, Corinthians, because they were so carnal, they had a habit of judging people by their outward appearance that Paul mentions here. And, and when they looked at Paul, they thought, not much, man. You know, uh, yeah, he writes tough letters, whatever, and, you know, but yeah, he ain't much. And I got to think of, you know, I, I, uh, a couple of weeks ago, you did the thing of, you know, kind of the correlated the thing in uh, Second Kings about the Star Wars stuff. And I think, you know, this is just like Star Wars too, you know. Remember when Luke Skywalker uh, goes to meet uh, Yoda the first time? And he's kind of annoyed by him, thinking he's just some pest, some little guy, you know. And, you know, he until Luke tries to use the force to raise his fighter jet, and he can't do it. And it's the whole thing is, oh, you look at me, you look at my size, you think I'm, you know, I'm, I, I'm no power kind of deal. And then, you know, we all know what happened, right? Yoda, mm, you know, raises the fighter jet, brings it to land and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> I don't believe that kind of thing. That's kind of what happened there when Paul was there at Corinth. They looked at him and go, yeah, 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 not much. But he's warning them, hey, I'm, I'm coming. And if I have to, I will be as bold with some, as just as bold as I am when I'm writing. And he's assuring him here that he has the authority from the Lord as an apostle. But he'd rather use the authority to edify them, which means to build them up. So hopefully that's what happens every time you come to church here. You get edified. You get built up and, and all that and blessed through the worship and worshiping God and, and that, but also built up as we get into God's word and see all of the promises, see how God wants us to apply his word into our lives and, and all that. It, and that's what I always hope as a pastor, that, that that happens, that you get edified every time you come here. But he doesn't want to have to bring the hammer down on them. But he would if he had to. <laughs> and they would see that power in action <laughs> that uh, was in his letters. They'd see it in person. And again, because he cared about their, their life in Christ and their eternity, Paul was willing to do what was necessary to see them continue in the faith. In verse 12, he says, For we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves, but they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. You know, that still goes on today. It still goes on a lot in a lot of different churches. There's those unbelievers who've gotten their degrees from schools of unbelief, or even seminaries of unbelief. And there's a lot of seminaries now that don't believe the Bible is the Word of God. They don't, uh, many of them don't believe in the virgin birth of Jesus, His sinless life, His vicarious death on the cross for us. They don't believe that, that either that He really died or that He died, and they don't believe that He really rose again from the dead physically, bodily. There's a lot of seminaries that are like that now. More and more are going that direction, kind of caving to pressure from the world. And I'll tell you, I'm not going to be one of them. I'm not going to be one of those pastors that goes that direction ever. I pray that God would smite me before I would ever do something stupid like that. And because, folks, you know, I care about pleasing the Lord. And because of that, I care that you guys get edified. I care that you guys get the truth and not a lot of nonsense. And, you know, there's a lot of these guys that they pat each other on the back for not believing the word of God. Oh, you're wise. Yeah, you're just like me. You're wise. Oh, yeah. And uh, I had a conversation with a guy when we were in Alaska. We were on this, this train from Fairbanks to Anchorage. And, 
he started using some foolish arguments that his denomination uses to discredit the Bible. And when I told him what Jesus said in John 14, 6, you know, where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. His, his answer was, well, Jesus didn't write anything, did he? <laughs> it's like, really? <laughs> kind of thing. I said, yeah, but eyewitnesses did. And there was four eyewitnesses that gave their account. And there were over 500 eyewitnesses of the resurrected Christ and all that. And when you start bringing those kind of things uh, on that, he, he asked me, do you really believe all that? I told him, I'm betting my life on it, both now and for all eternity. <laughs> and then he says, well, we should probably change the subject then. <laughs> yeah, well, okay, you know. But people within his denomination might pat him on the back for not being some ignorant, you know, uh, guy like me uh, that just believes everything that the Bible says. But, folks, that won't cut it when he stands before God. And he will stand before the Lord. He'll give an account. So will those who taught him those lies. Just like these heretics there in Corinth. Now, verses 13 through 16, he says, We, however, will not boast beyond measure, but within the limits of the sphere which God appointed us, a sphere which especially includes you. For we are not overextending ourselves as though our authority did not extend to you. For it was to you that we came with the gospel of Christ, not boasting of things beyond measure, that is, in other men's labors, but having hope that as your faith increased, we shall be greatly enlarged by you in our sphere to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and not to boast in another man's sphere of accomplishment. See, if Paul was going to boast about anything, he would boast of the things that God has done through he and his companions. And it would certainly include the Corinthians because it was he, he was the one who brought the gospel to them, as he says here, for the first time. It was through him that they heard the truth about Jesus Christ and got saved. And if anyone should recognize his authority as an apostle, it should be them. And Paul's hope was that, you know, as you guys grow in faith, you know, that, hey, my sphere of influence would increase. I'd be able to go and preach to, to those people beyond Corinth as they hear from you. Hey, man, the, the, this guy Paul, man, he's got the truth. He tells it like it is, man. He's, he's a straight shooter, you know. And kind of like, you know, if you grew up in the 60s and the 70s and all, uh, in the 70s, uh, you know, if you told somebody about, you know, hey, you, you know, why don't you come with me to this Billy Graham crusade? Those people had heard about Billy Graham. Everybody kind of knew about him, knew, well, he's a straight shooter. He'll tell the truth, and they would be inclined to go, even though maybe they didn't want to, but they go, at least this guy's not a wacko, you know, and, and I'll go and I'll, I'll hear some truth there or whatever. But, but he was known for preaching the, preaching the truth, and Paul really expected them at Corinth, who had been led to the Lord by him, to have that same mindset about him so that he could further the gospel beyond Corinth. And so in verses 17 and 18, he says, But he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. For not he who commends himself is approved, but whom the Lord commends. In verse 17, that's a reference to Jeremiah 9.24. It says, But let him who glories, glory in this, that he understands and knows me. This is God talking. That I am the Lord. And remember, all capital letters there for the word Lord is the proper name, Yahweh. I'm Yahweh, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. If you're going to brag, if you're going to be proud about anything, it should be that you know the Lord. It should be that, man, I, I, I'm one of God's kids. God is awesome. Brag about the Lord. Brag about the good things that he's done. In verse 18, it's a reference to Proverbs 27 too. Let another man praise you. And not your own mouth, <laughs> a stranger, and not your own lips. <laughs> like Paul says in verse 18, 
you know, somebody who pats themselves on the back, that's no big deal. Somebody approves of themselves saying, yeah, man, I'm, man, I'm right on. I'm a good guy. You know, you can trust me. Well, that doesn't mean much. That doesn't mean that you're really approved. But it is a big deal if the Lord commends you. Then you know you're approved. And the Lord did approve of Paul. And he confirmed it by the miracles and, and by the, the number of salvations that happened through his ministry. In chapter 11, the first four verses, he says, Oh, that you would bear with me in a little folly. And indeed, you do bear with me. For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. For I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. Paul had a godly jealousy for those that he had led to Christ, and really for every believer in Jesus. He, he had that godly jealousy, and there is two types of jealousy, right? There's godly and ungodly jealousy. That ungodly jealousy is oftentimes translated as envy. You know, to envy or be jealous over what somebody else has because you want it for yourself. It's a selfish thing. It's all about you. That kind of jealousy is condemned in Scripture. And that's the kind of, of jealousy that the religious leaders had about Christ. They were jealous that the people were following him, that they were listening to him, that he had these crowds that were, they were listening and kind of you know, hanging on every word that he said. And, all. and thousands of people were showing up at his rallies, <laughs> you know, you might call them that. There, there are thousands of people there, and they were jealous. Remember, when Jesus was tried, uh, Pilate or Herod said, that uh, he understood the reason why they brought them, uh, brought him to them to be judged was because of envy, because of jealousy. He knew w what the whole deal was all about. And, and you know, in 1 Corinthians 3, 3, we're told, for you are still carnal. Remember, he's taught, this is in his first letter to these people, these same people he's writing to. You're still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? And James 3.16 tells us, For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. And you see this in churches from time to time. Someone is jealous because somebody has a position within that fellowship that they think they should have, even though they're not gifted for it. Somebody else has that title. Somebody else has the respect to the people. Oh, they don't like that. You know? <laughs> and... And even when they do have that position, you see the jealousy rear its ugly head in that they won't train anybody to take their place in case God moves them on. They won't help to raise somebody else to teach them how to do what they do. No, they're, they're, they're jealous, man. They're afraid that, that they, these other people might be better than them and might take their place. Or, or that people will say, wow, he's really gifted, you know, kind of thing. That's, that's not good. That's carnal. But there's the godly jealousy. And that's the type of jealousy that God has for us. And there's a number of places that, that God talks about being jealous for his people. Like one of them is Deuteronomy 32, 16. They provoked him to jealousy with foreign gods. With abominations, they provoked him to anger. See, understand, God's jealousy for us isn't like the carnal jealousy. His jealousy for us is for our good. It's not seeking after his betterment, but it's seeking after our better, what's good for us. The, the thing is, God gets angry at and is jealous for us by anything that would take us away from him. And say, well, wait a minute, that sounds contradictory. No, because he's the only source of eternal life. Jesus is the only one that paid for our sins. Jesus is the only one that rose again from the dead. He's the only sacrifice that God will accept. And anything that would get in the way of that 
God doesn't like. God is jealous for us in that, in that way. And that's where Paul's heart was. He was concerned that they might believe the heretics and, and put their trust in a counterfeit Jesus, in a false go- gospel, receive a disparate, different spirit, not the Holy Spirit that they had received already. In verses 5 and 6, he says, For I consider that I am not at all inferior to the most eminent apostles, even though I am untrained in speech, yet I am not in knowledge. But we have been thoroughly manifested among you in all things. Paul had not uh, apparently went to any of the schools of the orators and all that, but he was trained in knowledge. Uh, We know that he sat at the feet of Gamaliel one of the preeminent teachers within Judaism. Paul, like he told the Pharisee, or like he told the uh, Philippian church, that he was a Hebrew of Hebrews uh, concerning the law of Pharisee. The Pharisees knew the word of God. They believed the word of God. So he was trained in knowledge, even though he didn't have the flowery speech that some of these orators had. But he considered himself the least of the apostles because he persecuted the church before being saved. And yet, he didn't consider himself inferior to any of the other apostles. Because, folks, he had the same office. He he had the same gifting. He had the same authority. In fact, Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. (laughs) That's pretty awesome. (laughs) He was not inferior. The, The same miracles worked through Paul that the other apostles were known for. And, and all this, he said, was thoroughly manifested among you in all things. When he lived there among them, they saw that. They saw the power of God working through him. They saw the miracles. Yeah. And they had seen that power of God. And they heard the clear teachings from him of the word of God. They heard that, that continuity. Uh, of all of the Old Testament scriptures that talked about Christ, that talked about the new covenant and all, as he presented that, they understood that. It's like, yeah, this, this is from God. In verses 7 through 11, he says, Did I commit sin in humbling myself that you might be exalted because I preached the gospel of God to you free of charge? I robbed other churches, taking wages from them to minister to you. And when I was present with you and in need... I was a burden to no one. For what I lacked, the brethren who came from Macedonia supplied. And in everything, I kept myself from being burdensome to you. And so I will keep myself as the truth of Christ is in me. No one shall stop me from this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Why? Because I do not love you? God knows. (laughs) You know, we've talked about this before, that how Paul knew what a big deal they made in Corinth of money. They were very wealthy, and money was a big deal to them. So he worked making tents while he was there. And when he ran short, he never asked them for help. Instead, other churches, those in Macedonia, helped him financially, like the church in Philippi, which is in Macedonia. He, He thanked and encourage the Philippians in Philippians 4.15 for this very thing. He says, Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. See, God knew Paul did what he did because he really loved those in Corinth. Because he really wanted to see see them receive the gospel and and to see them in heaven. (laughs) And he didn't want money to be a stumbling block for the gospel. So he didn't let it be that. He took that off the table. In verses 12 through 15, he says, But what I do, I will also continue to do, that I may cut off the opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are in the things of which they boast. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. See, 
Paul was going to continue to operate the way that he had been operating. He was going to continue to cut off the opportunity of those, you know, those who wanted to be say, yeah, we're just like Paul. <laughs> no, you aren't. No, you're not. No, <laughs> they weren't. Paul had a heart for the people. <laughs> These false apostles had a heart for what the people had, <laughs> had a heart for the people's money. That's where they were at. They were false apostles. And really, he calls them here Satan's ministers, <laughs> ministers of Satan. They preached a false gospel, a different way to heaven. <laughs> and it was something other than by grace through faith in Jesus alone. There, there are those, and they're well-meaning believers, and they say, oh, you, that, that's so harsh. And when I have... Uh, spoken against certain teachings or heresies, whatever, uh, or even certain cults and, and, uh, and teachings of certain cults. Oh, that's terrible. They're, they're, they're well-meaning. They're, they're such nice people. But folks, there's nothing nice about allowing yourself to be used by the devil to send people to hell. <laughs> that ain't nice. <laughs> and Galatians, you know, the, the church at Galatia, Paul was concerned about the same thing because there was there were these people that would go behind Paul, the Judaizers, the false apostles. And he would go into a, an area that had no churches. They had not heard the gospel. He'd go in there, he'd preach the gospel. He'd stay with them six months, a year, two years, three years, whatever. Build up the church and get them all situated and, and standing firm in the faith and, and all that and appoint elders and pastors and all that. And then he'd go on to the next town. <clears throat> but as soon as they got word, hey, Paul's gone, they would creep on in there. Oh, hey, you guys are believers? Cool. How did you hear about Jesus? Oh, well, Paul the apostle was here. Oh, Paul, yeah, he means well. But see, he really doesn't have the whole scoop. Let, let, let us straighten you out. Let us really get you saved now. And they would lay on this nonsense, either keeping the law or, or whatever, and to the Galatians in chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, he said, I marvel. <laughs> we would say, it blows my mind that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. And that word that he uses there, uh, accursed, the, the Greek word under that is the word anathema, which uh, one of the translations is, uh, condemned to the, desi the direst of woes. Uh, some have said it means that they were cursed to the hottest part of hell. <laughs> that that's what he was saying for them. Not very politically correct, right? Not very seeker sensitive. But it was the truth. See, that's the heart of God coming out in a real apostle and somebody that really has the heart of God for God's people. That's, that's how he felt. And folks, we've got to be careful about what we hear and what we believe. We've got to test everything against the word of God. In, in 1 Thessalonians 5.21, uh, we're told, test all things. Hold fast what is good. In other words, don't hold fast. Let go of the bad stuff, the stuff that is not good. But the good stuff, hold fast to it. Hold on to it. Hold tight. 1 John 4, one says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit. But test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. From time to time, you'll hear the Bible referred to as the canon of Scripture. Uh, you know, not the kind of big gun thing, it shoots big things, you know. That's C-A-N-N-O-N. -N. This is C-A-N-O-N, -N, which literally means a measuring rod. And that's what the Bible is. It's a measuring rod that we can measure anything that, that alleges or purports to be from God. Anything that says, hey, this is spiritual, this is right on, this is from God. Oh, really? Let's see. Let's whip out the Word of God. What does God say about this in His Word? 
And folks, if it doesn't measure up, then we got to let it go. We, we've got to turn away from it. And the, the, the doctrines that are in the word of God, they're sure, they're solid. God doesn't change. His word doesn't change. We can count on them. God doesn't change his mind. He's not fickle. So we can test everything by his word. It, it never changes. It, it's always faithful, always trustful. And so verses 16 through 19, I say again, let no one think me a fool. If otherwise, at least receive me as a fool. You know, if you're going to think me a fool, well, then go ahead and receive me like a fool. You know, that I also may boast a little. What I speak, I speak not according to the Lord, but as it were, foolishly, in this confidence of boasting. Seeing that many boast according to the flesh, I also will boast. For you put up with fools gladly, since you yourselves are wise. Okay, he's being sarcastic here. <laughs> you can't get around that. Uh, and, you know, there are t every now and then, I, you know, I, I tend to be sarcastic sometimes. And people have gotten on, on me about, that's not very Christ-like. Really? <laughs> what Bible are you reading here? <laughs> and he's, he's being sarcastic. Because the church, again, was very carnal. They consider themselves to be very wise, though. Oh, yeah. But they were just wise according to the things of the world, not according to the word of God. And, and since they put up with these, these false apostles who bragged about their degrees, they're, they're being endorsed by this false apostle or that false apostle, all their learning and, and their ability to, to schmooze the people with flowery words and all that, uh, and bragged about how many people they had reached for Christ. Well, and Paul says, okay. Since you're into that, you know, if that's what's going to take to ring your bell, then let me brag a little bit. But he points out how unwise they were for putting up with the false apostles. Verses 20 and 21, he says, For you put up with it if one brings you into bondage, if one devours you, you know, eats you up, if one takes from you, if one exalts himself, if one strikes you on the face. To our shame, I say that we were too weak for that. But in whatever anyone is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. It's amazing to me what people will put up with from false teachers, from cult leaders. They allow themselves to be totally taken advantage of. And we've seen over the course of my lifetime, I've seen a number of those things. I remember... Uh, it was either right before or right after I got saved. You know, the whole Jim Jones thing in Guyana, you know, with the Kool-Aid and all that. Uh, that happened. And it amazes me that people would follow somebody like that, some of the things that he said and the way that he twisted the word of God. There's, you know, there's a number of cults that, that operate in the U.S. and one especially up here that's really big. And it amazes me that, People will believe what they teach, even though it's contrary to the known word of God, the Bible, and even allow themselves to be put under bondage. I had one guy tell me that he and his wife got in trouble. They were brought in uh, before the elders because uh, they didn't seem to be tithing as much as they should. And so the elders demanded to see their, their tax returns for the last year. And it's like, you put up with that? Well, yeah, you know, we have to. And I kind of think, wow, no, you don't. And verses uh, 20, well, verse 22. He says, are they Hebrews? Well, so am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. You know, if they want to play the race card, <laughs> he said, okay, you know. We're Jews, you know, God's chosen people. Therefore, we know what we're talking about. Well, if that's what it took to be believed, well, Paul's saying, I'm one too. <laughs> you know, and we're, like he said to the Philippians, man, I Hebrew of Hebrews. Uh, kind of a deal where he's saying, man, if anybody, like we would say, you know, I'm an American man, you know, waving the flag and all that kind of stuff. Or, uh, you know, he says, concerning the law of Pharisee, you know, he, he was somebody that believed in all of the scripture 
and, and he believed in the miracles that were there. He believed in the promises of God and all that. And, and so he's saying, well, you want to go there? <laughs> They're Jews? I am too. <laughs> and now he gets to his credentials of his apostleship. And this, folks, is just something that when they read it, I'm sure that they were taken back by it because they had never really conser- considered this. And I hope that tonight it kind of hits you in such a way that you, you look at Paul in a different light after this, that you really understand how committed he was to the Lord and to the mission that God had sent him on to preach the gospel. Really, it's the same mission that he sent us on, going to all the world to preach the gospel, right? To every creature. <laughs> look at his credentials in verses 23 through 29. Are they ministers of Christ or servants of Christ? That's what minister means. I speak as a fool. I am more. And labor is more abundant. Remember, he had already talked about how he worked with his hands while he was there. He wouldn't take money from. In stripes above measure. It wasn't that he wore striped robes and all that. Stripes were the scars that were left on his body from the beatings, from the whips and all. He says, I can't even count. I can't even count how many stripes i got on my body. And in prisons, more frequently, you read through the book of Acts, and it doesn't record everything that Paul suffered. But, dude, was, he was in and out of jail all the time. You know? And he says, in deaths often. You know, in other words, he had these near-death experiences. He, he was close to being killed all the time. He says, from the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. You know, those 39 lashes or cat of nine tails. Five times they laid those on him. Three times I was beaten with rods. You know, we saw a few years ago the guy that was caned, I think it was in Singapore. Remember the caning that happened and the world was, you know, really up in arms. But he says, hey, man, three times I was beaten with rods. And once I was stoned. That was with rocks, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys often. And understand, journeys back then, when we think about, oh, yeah, let's take a journey. You know, like my wife and I, you know, uh, taking a journey to Alaska and then journeying through Alaska. Nothing like the journeys back then. You know, our daughter paid for first-class airfare there and back. And then she rented this really nice luxury SUV. And, on, and then we had the, the train ride from Fairbanks uh, to Anchorage back there. It was, you know, first-class accommodations. And, and you know, it was, it was total luxury. We weren't sweating anything. But when they traveled in their day, oh, baby, <laughs> you were taking your life in your hands. You know, the, you, Anything and everything could happen. A lot of people didn't make it to their destination because they were killed en route. He says, he says, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often. In hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides the other things, what comes upon me daily? My deep concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to stumble and I do not burn with indignation? See, Paul is holding these things out as his credentials of being a real, true apostle of Jesus Christ. Because... You know, the apostle means a sent out one. And only someone that was truly sent out by Christ, only somebody that was truly on a mission for God would endure those kind of things in order to fulfill that ministry. And and what he says at the end there, the worst of it, he says, what comes upon me daily is my deep concern for all the churches. See, he was concerned deeply about the well-being of the churches, concerned about those false teachers who would come behind him and and try and take advantage of them, lead them astray, get them to believe in a false Jesus, a false gospel, get them tied back to works and and, and all that kind of stuff. And and that really just gnawed at him all the time that 
it was possible that these guys would come and do damage to these people that he cared about. And, and he says, when they were made to stumble, when any of them were made to stumble, he says he burned with indignation. And isn't it a lot harder to either watch or, or hear of someone that you love being hurt as opposed to just being hurt yourself? I mean, those of you who are parents, you know how that is. When your kid's sick or when your kid's been hurt, oh, I wish it was me, not them, right? That's the kind of love that Paul had for them. And then finally, in verses 30 to 33, he says, If I must boast, I will boast in the things which concern my infirmity, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. In Damascus, the governor, under Aretas the king, was guarding the city of the Damascians with a garrison, desiring to arrest me. But I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped from his hands. <laughs> Those are the kind of things that Paul would boast of. <laughs> the beatings, the imprisonments, and all that. The perils that he faced that not only proved he, he wasn't in it to take from people, but to give them the truth of the gospel, the word of God. And nothing was going to stop him. None of those kind of things that would stop somebody that was just in it to take from people. Because we've seen those kind of people. When the going gets rough, oh, hey, man, I'm, I'm out of here. I'm going to do something else. The false apostles, the ministers of Satan, couldn't hold out those credentials. <laughs> they, couldn't, they couldn't say, oh, yeah, yeah, we, we suffered those things too. Uh, they were in it for what they could get, not what they could give. And they'd peddled their heresy as long as it was profitable for them, not Paul. And Paul, he'll go on next week, and hopefully we'll finish uh, 2 Corinthians, and we'll wrap it up then. Let's stand up and pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you what we've seen in it this evening, the encouragement, Again, your great love and, and the, the concern you have for us and that concern that you put on the hearts of those uh, who are to care for your people. Father, help us to fulfill our ministry. Help us to do what you have called us to do, whatever it is. Lord, we want to please you and help us to have a love for those around us the very people that you died for. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. We will see you on Sunday, Lord willing, and the church don't rise. And in that case, we'll see you sooner, right? <laughs>